So welcome everyone to webinar series uh, number three, or the, the series is the series, but uh, installment number three, um, Rick Ricky sculling from the inside out. Uh, we will continue the webinar series uh, every Wednesday for the foreseeable future at 4 p.m. Next week's webinar is going to, uh, it, was, it was actually, the topic was inspired by uh, something that was said during Kevin's presentation last week uh, regarding people doing drills and not, the, the, the most common reason for doing drills being because the coach told me to, or we always do this drill. So we thought it would be an interesting thing to have a webinar um, answering the question of what is that drill for? So several of our coaches, um, let's see, Carol and Jeannie and Ellen and um, uh, Helen, uh, Helen Tillman and myself, we will all explain at least one of our favorite drills and what we often use it for um, and entertain questions at the end of the presentation. But today's presentation is all Rick all the time. Um, in his Parnassian glory, his yeah. presentation is uh, called Sculling from the Inside Out. And uh, he says he's going to tell us how, that the, how the core relates to the inherent action of the skulls and the geometry of the shell. And uh, I will let him get right to that. Okay. And everyone, yeah, go ahead, Rick. Let me, let okay, me, Troy. Uh, I'll okay, share Troy. my screen and get your presentation up. Okay, great. Okay, Troy, thank you. Oops, what's that? Uh, okay. So anyway, uh, thanks, Troy. Thank you, Erica. Um, I have uh, made a couple of notes that aren't on the, on the um, slides just to uh, start off here. So first of all, welcome. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to do this. And uh, there's a bunch of stuff. I, I've given myself, I have a watch here, so I'm timing myself. But anyway, I'd like to thank Troy and for his uh, support. And Erica, she's done a great job of helping me with this. Sheldon, our IT person, Steve Welpley, GRP. Lucas Bello, who did some downloading of my footage of Thomas Langa um, in absentia, Frank, who helped me create it 10, 15 years ago. And certainly the Craftsbury, Craftsbury Outdoor Center, um, Dick Judy, and then in, in memory of Al Russell and Janet, who uh, had a big impact on my um, my coaching um, career. Um, so anyway, um, today is um, exciting for me and I've thought about this and worked to try to make this as relevant as possible. Um, it's always a challenge and I'm finding this uh, to be an interesting new um, nuance to coaching to be able to make sense and speak to a computer when you can't see the people in the audience. So um, I'm still learning and I'm relatively uncomfortable with this, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, I'd like to say uh, also, just as a preface, um, the summer of 2020, if there's, any, if there's any silver lining in this pandemic, and I certainly hope everyone is doing as well as you possibly can, is that um, this is gonna give everybody a time without competition to possibly deconstruct and reconstruct your stroke. And um, so I think that this talk today perhaps will help you in that regard. In addition, um, I think it's also without a lot of racing opportunities, at least um, publicly, perhaps in your practice venue, there's a chance to um, really just enjoy sculling and the movement and the efficiency and the beauty and exhilaration of just sculling. So I think that if you want to look and try to find a positive from the pandemic, I think that's uh, certainly one of them, or maybe the only one. Um, anyway, uh, I started coaching at Craftsbury and teaching in 1982. Uh, started coaching in 1973. I rode at Trinity, and I'm presently the head coach of men's rowing at Connecticut College. So, um, for no further uh, ado, I'd like to go first of all to this first slide um, that uh, Marcel Proust, uh, a really inspirational quote that um, that he I picked up, and it's really uh, to me the essence of life, but certainly in coaching, uh, the real act of discovery consists in not in finding new lands and not finding new lands, but seeing with new eyes. And so I'd like to uh, continue to encourage people to see their sculling with new eyes. And in that um, regard, uh, one quote that I really like uh, is from the uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind, Suzuki. And he, um, he says, 
beginner's mind. In the beginner's mind, there are, very, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. So you might want to take a look at that book at some time, but that's been really inspirational for me from a pure philosophical perspective. Okay, Troy, flip it on. Here we go. Next, next uh, slide. All right. Uh, these are a couple of um, what I would say quasi-philosophical um, ideas, and more. these are in more depth if you go into the supplemental information that uh, Erica alluded to. Um, but understanding sculling from needs to be understood from more than one perspective. And I think that that's true um, for perspectives having to do with the geometry of the sport, but also from the perspectives that may be a little bit more intangible regarding, as an example, what, how are you feeling on the day that you go sculling? And some days, I'm sure if you've done athletics, as most of you have, some days you're just having a bad day. It might be really worth taking into consideration what's happening, why am I having a bad day, what perhaps is going on internally that would be helpful for me to um, appreciate and to contemplate and perhaps uh, deal with um, not so much in the moment, perhaps later to reflect upon that. But I think when I said sculling from the inside out, I wasn't just talking about biomechanics. I was also talking about what I would consider to be the more attitudinal or for, for lack of a better term, the spiritual aspects of the sport. Um, next, prioritize technical development, ever increasing awareness and ongoing satisfaction. Um, a couple of years ago, one of our guests, and I won't mention her name, uh, she's a sweetie and she's very passionate. And I said, uh, you know, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And um, at first, I think I mildly offended her, but I said it only from the standpoint of probably be, uh, to be supportive. And um, I think that that second slide um, in the second bullet point is, is that, is to say, whoops, back up. Yeah, there you are. Back, oop, there you go. Um, to that idea of ever increasing awareness and um, continuing to get better uh, technically. And I also like to explain to people that even though you're losing your physiological power over the course of your life, if you get technically more efficient, it's possible to actually go faster, even though your physiology is diminished. So I would encourage you to keep that as one of your basic precepts as you approach the sport. Then the last one, and again, there's more information in the supplemental that you can look at if you're interested. And I said, study the sages and seek sources of insight outside the world of sculling. I'm really big on this one. And I think the performing arts um, are really one of the more motivating aspects of uh, this third bullet point. Uh, I've had some of the most valuable insights into sculling, believe it or not, from our dance department at Connecticut College. And that's just one of many. Uh, I also like to um, listen to and study opera and singing. I think there's a lot that can be learned from disciplines that maybe on the surface don't seem to be quite as relevant as you might expect. And so my last bullet point of this particular slide, um, and again, there's more information if you're interested, uh, seeks to um, encourage you to, to be more eclectic and look beyond uh, just sculling or sculling books or what you see on Road 2K. Look beyond it. I think there's a lot of information and inspiration that you can gain from um, from other areas, especially in uh, performing arts. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, getting into core awareness. Um, core awareness is fundamental sculling from the inside out. Well, and you know, the word, as I go into my second bullet point, definitions of the core vary. A good start is to think of the core as the totality of the large muscles of the hips, midsection acting in unison with the muscles of the chest and mid back. Um, just as a little bit of a segue, I was at a Joy of Sculling meeting and Ed McNeely, who's an exercise physiologist and worked with the Canadian Olympic rowing team for many years and is very well known in the profession, uh, was giving a talk at the Joy of Sculling over 10 years ago. And he was talking about the history of uh, the idea of core training and the idea of the core. And I asked him a question. I said, Ed, where do you define the core? What is the core? And I don't say this is the only definition of core, and I'm sure that there's other people who might disagree with this, but I liked it. He said, the core is from your knees to your elbows. And I really like that. And so I'd like to throw that out as an idea. I think the core is more than your ability to do sit-ups, but certainly the, uh, the core is something that, from my perspective, if you study movement, is where the movement, for lack of a better way to say it, originates. Okay, and the third, bullet point, performing exercises just before sculling to bring awareness to the core. And these are listed in the supplemental information. But one of the classic exercises that I would encourage you to, um, 
considering you've probably always done this, is squat jumps. Very simple, squat jumps are extremely um, beneficial and only not so much for a workout. It doesn't have to be too hard. You don't have to do too many, but I would suggest that when you do a squat jump, you would be doing that jump from the inside out. And so think about that idea of jumping and what jumping is about and how you would jump. So when you jump, you don't really concentrate on straightening your legs out. You concentrate on a movement which we're very familiar with, which might actually be hard to articulate, but where do you jump from? You jump from your hips, you jump from the in, inner part of your abdominal area. Uh, you naturally do that, you firm, you firm it up, you get into the squat position. And so one of the exercises in the supplemental is jumping. And I would suggest squat jumps as a warm up, but they don't have to be extremely um, stressful, just give them a shot. Uh, the next one I would suggest also is perhaps hanging from a bar and bringing your knees to your chest. That might be also another um, aspect of that. So uh, keep, keep that in mind for um, the exercises to engage or to at least bring your, familiar, bring your familiarity up with your core. Okay, uh, the idea of weight shift. Um, weight shift could be simply something as simple as moving your weight from one foot to the other. And when you do that, notice where the movement comes from. Notice how if you shift your weight from your left foot to your right foot, where does the movement actually originate? And I would suggest that it originates in your hips. And um, that would be perhaps um, a hint as to where the effort comes when you're actually sculling. Um, this one here, which most of you may be familiar with, is sometimes called a pick drill, and there are variations on this, but sculling with your seat fixed, with that swinging motion of your torso, shoulders, and arms is one smooth motion. A lot of you are familiar with that. I don't call it the pick drill, but it's called sculling with your seat fixed. is incredibly important and very valuable. Again, not doing it very quickly and taking that as the beginning of your motion. Just as a sort of an aside, when you're doing that, when you're sculling with your seat fixed, notice that if you flex your butt muscles, if you contract your inner uh, core, if you contract the lower part of your abdominals in combination with your, your uh, gluteal maximus muscles, etc., that you get the swinging motion. And I think that that's another hint as to what engages or ultimately engages the extension of your legs from your hips. Um, the next one, which is again, um, I don't even want to call it a drill. Sculling with your feet out. Um, sculling with your feet out is as old as sculling, I think. Uh, Steve Fairbairn talks about it. But I think that sculling with your feet out um, really encourages you to use your core and discourages um, using, your, using your appendages, pushing and pulling with your legs, pushing, pulling with your arms. Um, and I think that that is um, another way to really get an insight into sculling from the inside out. Um, in the supplemental information, I make an, 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 uh, a suggestion that you're all aware, perhaps if you've sculled with your feet out, that you always run the risk of falling in. One way to um, alleviate that and still get the effect is to make your shoes loose so the top part of your foot is, um, has some space between the shoes and the top part of your foot, or if you have straps in your boat, et cetera. And so then you can scull with your feet out, and if you do make a mistake or lose your balance at the release, you can catch yourself against the oarlock. And I would suggest um, that, uh, whoops, back up just a second. I would suggest that um, sculling with your feet out is a way to activate the core. And um, it really makes a difference. One additional aspect of that, which I would encourage people to keep in mind, try to keep the bottoms of your feet, um, at least part of your foot, the balls of your feet or your heels, depending on where you are in the stroke, try to keep those in contact with the foot plate at all times. And so sculling with your feet out presupposes that your feet don't come popping off the foot stretcher. If they do, that's a sign that perhaps you didn't engage your core correctly or completely. Um, and then as you continue, and again, this is part of what would be called the pick drill, um, increase hip flexion, which would be the same thing as moving the slide. Eventually, as you know, if you're confident and you've been sculling a long time, eventually you'll get to the point of full, what would be full flexion or what we'd call full compression, where your shins are at right angles to the water. And uh, that would be, in my definition, called full flexion of the hips. Uh, it doesn't have to be done over um, 10 strokes. It could be done over numerous strokes. And I would encourage you to um, consider that. Um, okay, let's see. Where are we here? I just lost it there, Troy. Okay, hold on a second. All right. Okay. Um, 
All right, here we go. So now we got into some of the more, um, what I would consider to be the more philosophical aspect of some of my slides. And um, these are the ideas that I wanted to throw out, which all build off of sculling from the inside out. And the first, and just to sort of preface the slides, uh, as I say, they all implicitly follow from core awareness and activation. Um, Whoops. I'm Sorry moving. about that. Hold, hold yeah. on a second, Rick. I, it, it, my screen keeps freezing on my slideshow and it's causing me a little bit of uh, anxiety. So I want to see if I can fix this. Yeah, please. Okay, that's not going to help me. Um, we'll, we'll just go back to it. Okay. You want to slide? All right, so the following ideas, concepts off the water. They, and this is ideas that you have to contemplate. Um, and I'll mention a little bit more about this as we get down to the bottom of this particular slide. Uh, but again, they all implicitly follow from core awareness and activation of these ideas, which we'll be reading in a moment. Um, over time, that will inform your sculling aptitude on the water and will naturally lead to further insights, which is very, very important. I sometimes use the word derivative. If you're out there sculling and you've used one of these concepts and something else occurs to you either on the water or off the water and you try it, you develop your own ideas about the sport. And if it makes sense and it feels better, you're having what I would consider to be a derivative experience of sorts where one idea leads to another. And if the sculling keeps getting better, you could probably safely say that you're on the right track toward um, self uh, awareness and teaching yourself how to scull, which by the way, I think is an immensely important aspect of the sport. Um, okay, this one is important. Uh, sometimes uh, students at Crassbury, they um, get a little bit confused as to what the process is on the water. And the mental images that you have um, on land are important, but when you get on the water, you have to um, feel. So try to think on land and feel on the water. That's a distillation of something that Fairbairn writes about a lot. And he talks about uh, this idea, as they used to say in England, talking shop. So he encourages or encouraged his, his athletes to talk about the sport, to debate the sport, to think about it and talk about it. And then when they got on the water, it's just a feel for it. So I think it's really important. Don't think yourself into um, a paralysis on the water. Do the thinking off the water, feel on the water. Eventually what you're doing on land will permeate uh, or allow you to uh, have a way of interpreting what's going on when you're, when you're out there and you're feeling things happening. Eventually that interpretive uh, experience uh, based on what your concepts are and what you feel, they'll mutually enhance each other and that's how you uh, continue to advance um, in the sport. And I think it's, it's a process, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, I would underline that being patient is incredibly important. Um, as Fairbairn says, you're better sculling um, after 10 years than you were after five. And so this is a long-term lifelong experience. Please be patient. Okay, flip it over, Tried for the next one. Okay, uh, one concept, which I think is really powerful. It may seem obvious. Um, we use the word system. I've used that word a lot and think about it as uh, one of my basic ideas in the sport. But the sculler, the skulls and the shell is a unified system. And it may seem obvious or it may seem a little bit stating, stating the obvious, but I think it has some very interesting implications. Um, the next bullet point, move the system relative to the shoreline, not you, the seat and the skulls relative to the shell. So again, that may seem to be a relatively uh, simple statement, but if you really think about how you understand the sport of sculling, that may actually start to cause uh, you to pause about your uh, internal narrative of the sport. So as an example, just a very simple example, given that second bullet point, it would be inappropriate, in my humble opinion, to tell an athlete to drive their legs. Because implicit in that statement is the idea of the athlete and the body part moving relative to the shell. So um, I would just encourage you to think about this. Now, this perspective, I have to admit, is based on my many years sitting in a coaching lunch, uh, both at Crassbury and in Connecticut, watching the crews or watching the scholars moving along the shoreline. So as I say, move the system relative to the shoreline, not you, the seat and the skulls relative to the shell. I think I'm just gonna leave that one where it is and encourage you to maybe think about it as time goes on, but maybe with some thought, you'll start to question perhaps your internal narrative of how you actually articulate the stroke to yourself. Okay, 
Let's have the next one. All right, let's see. Um, this one is a tough one. And I, I, I'm just taking complete responsibility for this. Um, I still haven't really been able to generate some excitement about the idea of a hip follow through. And so to, when I wrote this slide, I was trying really hard to come up with a way to communicate this idea. And um, Fairbairn alludes to it in his writings, but it's, it's not an easy, easy idea to understand, but I'll try it the best I can. Search for the timing of the blades leaving the water in a way that leads to a pivot on the sit bones, bowered hip thrust of the seat and shell. So what's happening is you can imagine for most of you who've been sculling, as you get close to the release, you have a little bit of body angle, your blades are in the water, your oar handles, and you're are coming closer to your body. This idea of a bowered hip thrust, where instead of your torso, think about this, moving toward your feet, that your hips slide toward the finish line. And so, as I say in the next bullet point, this establishes what coaches frequently refer to as the body over position. So at, with all due respect to the coaches who coach, um, I would encourage you to think about, or anyone for that matter, to think about the idea of the body over position as a function, not of your chest moving, whoops, moving toward your feet as you release, but instead your hips moving toward the bow as you release, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Troy, I got a smaller um, slide this time. There you go. Okay, thank you. So again, I'll leave that for questions later, but that's, that's the idea that I'm trying to promote. Okay, um, at this point, contraction at the core, especially where the hamstring muscles attach to the sit bones and aggressive dorsiflexion of the ankles in combination with core action of the torso direct, directed laterally at the oarlocks using the skulls allows the sculler to move the shell bowward under the seat. I'm sure some of you have heard this. I do think it's possible, but it, um, it is, requires a bunch of other things falling into place just right, one of which would be the, the follow through or the hip uh, boward thrust. So uh, I throw that out, but in, uh, last year I wrote a tech tip or two years I wrote a tech tip regarding flexion in the ankles. But the idea of bringing your heels of your feet towards your sit bones instead of your sit bones toward the heels of your feet, i.e. bring the boat underneath you, is a concept which is a certainly um, uh, not easy, but it's the ideal. And I think it has some great spin-offs if you're patient enough and willing to uh, understand what you're aspiring to. So um, maybe that's going to stimulate some questions, which would, be, which would be great. Okay, the next concept, concept C. All right. Well, this builds right into what I just said. Let the skulls always lead. So I just talked about what is normally called the recovery. So imagine that you've had your hip thrust Boward, um, you got your body angle, your body over from your hips moving toward the finish line, your oar handles and your oar skulls are resting on the oar handles. And now let the oar handles lead, meaning that if you flex your ankles and you flex in your hips, the boat comes underneath you, the oar handles and your body are moving into full flexion. You don't need to push your hands toward the starting line. The oar handles get into, so to speak, the finish, I'm sorry, into the catch position as, for, as a function of the boat moving underneath the seat. Um, and then I say in the second body, uh, second bullet point here, to achieve this goal, visualize continu continual vertical weight shift. And I put, I talk about the air and water phase of the stroke, which is most people call it the, the uh, drive and recovery, um, using a continuously activated core, which would be another way of saying sit up. Um, last week, Carol Bauer, in one of our talks um, with our group introduction, talked about lifting the chest up. And I think this is part of what I'm referring to in this particular bullet point. But shifting your weight from your sit bones or some fraction of your weight from the sit bones to the ends of the oar handles directed at the oar locks will facilitate, along with your feet, the run of the boat underneath the seat and also that is facilitated by the lateral pressure that's a, applied to your oarlocks, lateral meaning sideways. Um, uh, Gordon Hamilton talks about this. Uh, Steve Fairbairn talks about this. And I think it's uh, a function of vertical weight shift. Uh, remember, you have an overlap, which also facilitates that. So that's the idea I'm trying to promote in concept C, second bullet point. Um, OK, then I say in this bullet point, the third one, this is a key concept, but can be difficult to achieve because the natural tendency is for the average sculler to try and push the blades through the water 
or push the handle sternward and reach for reach and reach in preparation for the next stroke. I know that Troy um, is always teasing me because I don't like to use the R word, the R word being reach. So if you're really getting the boat to come underneath the seat, you're not reaching for anything. Your feet are overtaking your sit bones. The oar handles are getting um, back into the fully flexed position as a function of the run of the boat. And you don't want to move your hands toward the starting line. That's the idea. I think it's doable. It's possible. Um, one little sidebar to this, which might be helpful. And you, if you're getting it and you notice, if you look at your puddles, you'll notice if you do this correctly, that the puddles are moving away from your oar handles, your oar handles aren't moving toward the puddles. So you might wanna keep that in mind. Uh, looking at your puddles is a really good way of understanding this sport. Okay, concept, concept D, please. All right, this one is, again, builds on the idea of the core. Remember that sculling is a way to move over the water. That may seem obvious, but a lot of times when I'm watching scullers at Crassbury, I get the impression that sculling is a form of effort, that they're just trying to make a lot of effort and they don't realize that they're impeding their movement. So uh, sculling is a form of movement. See what you can do to facilitate movement, diminish effort, facilitate movement. You actually go faster with less effort. Um, and I say that in the second bullet point, insight into the nature of the movement requires less effort, not more. And I would say it's almost uh, a fact of life that most people in sculling, and you're, myself included, I have to work on this all the time because of my college habits, et cetera, and misunderstanding of the sport late early on when I first started sculling, was effort of, as opposed to movement. Um, I've had incredible luck teaching dancers how to scull. Um, and one of the things I think you can say with a lot of uh, confidence is dancers are experts in movement. And when I put a dancer in a single, that person uh, and I've had male and female dancers, that person has in, un, intuitively understand un, or understands the idea of movement. Um, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned uh, the dance department at Connecticut College. That's all about movement. And I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to uh, understand sculling by way of the uh, concept of movement. By the way, to uh, give an accolade or a call out to Jim Joy, Jim Joy always used to say he would have loved to seen Fred Astaire as a sculler. And I think, you know, movement people are just awesome in that regard. Um, keeping activated core musculature and aspire to feel all the body parts moving together in concert with the skulls in the shell. Um, I want to go back to the um, um, inspiration of Jim, Jim Barker. And I remember Jim Barker when he used to coach at the center back in the 80s. And he would talk about all the body parts moving together. Jim Barker was big on that. And I think body parts moving together, uh, Peter Mallory probably has something to add to this, but I would really encourage that as opposed to the segmented movements in bullet point four of this concept D, avoid, and again, I say this respectfully because I know some coaches still like to have this dichotomy, legs back arms, arms back legs. I used to coach that way. I do not think that's really helpful in, with all due respect. Okay, uh, concept E, please. All right, this is a, this is a little bit more of an attitudinal um, uh, slide in a sense. Do not struggle for the exact replication of a, particular, a particularly pleasing stroke, but instead embrace the idea that every stroke is unique and instructive and continuous change and adaptation is what makes sculling appealing. So I think sometimes when people have a good stroke and then the stroke isn't, the next stroke isn't as good, they get all worked up. And I think that that just makes your life a lot more difficult and is really not in keeping with the spirit of sculling. Sculling is this ongoing, continuous, continu continuously evolving activity that um, is engaging, at least in my opinion, and that's why it's appealing, as I said in, the, in, this, in this bullet point. And that's why I think it's fun. I have to say, um, without becoming, and I'm not trying to make this, um, in any manner, shape, or form, dissing ergometers. But I have to say that one of the things that makes ergometer rowing hard, at least for me, is it's too much the same movement over and over and over again. And I will quote Mike Tatey on this. Mike Tatey said that rowing the ergometer is your, is your absolute gold standard for overuse injuries because it's the same movement over and over. So I would suggest that sculling, building on this bullet point is the idea of, of, of just going with the flow and understanding that because you're dealing with water, which has an element of chaos, to it that going, uh, understanding that this is always gonna be different is really fun, helpful, and uh, will help you to be a better sculler. Okay, concept, um, next concept, please. All right, building on that idea, a good stroke today will most likely be a lesser stroke tomorrow. 
And so what I mean by that is simply what I said. Um, so, you know, you're going to keep getting better. And within that context, some days are going to go well and some days will not. And you got to understand this. And so I always tell the athletes on my team, and I've said this to people at Crashbury, if you're having a particularly good day, don't get too big ahead because probably you're going to crash and burn and have a series of lesser days. And conversely, if things aren't going well, don't lose heart. Sometimes magically things will get better. So um, just be aware of that ebb and flow of your sculling process. And I don't want to say it's fun when you're having a bad day, but if you get a, the proper attitude toward that, I think you'll, you'll be the better for it and it'll make your overall sculling process um, more enjoyable and beneficial and helpful and fun. Um, this one too builds on that idea, be an observer and not a judge and enjoy the moment. If you have a bad stroke, and again, I've unfortunately seen scholars at Crassbury, they have a bad stroke and you can see them, this self-admonishment, they're turning their head back and forth. They, they might actually slam the water or something with their hand. They get really upset. They get really frustrated. They're judging, not a good idea. It doesn't help your sculling. Just let it go, stay relaxed, observe, do not judge, enjoy the sport, whether it's what you consider good or bad and eventually um, you'll be the better for it overall. Okay, next concept, please. All right. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this one, a light touch, ease of balance, and the possibility for precise timing at the turns, meaning the turns, meaning the catch and the release, if you want to use those terms, is facilitated when you give up holding the skulls. This is a big one. Um, uh, I skull on the Thames River, which is pretty choppy. So I'm using a Zephyr. I used a Zephyr last night. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to skull with the idea that I'm going to almost let go of the oar handles. And um, we were talking about this the other day in another talk, Troy and I and Larry Gluckman, the idea that the skulls are resting, the skulls rest on the oar locks. And as, as a pull, uh, bullet point B will say, um, the, oar, the skulls are resting on the oar locks and let the whole of your torso rest on the handles. And so all your weight, even though your stomach and your lower back and your core is firm, that you want to let your weight beyond the oar locks by, by virtue of the effect of the lateral um, uh, mechanical potential of the skulls to, to apply sideways force, that will keep, first of all, keep you relaxed. And secondly, that will also, as I say in bullet point three of concept G, the downward force present, presents or present as a function of the mass of your torso and the skulls, holds the oar locks down and has the added effect of moving the shell bowward under the seat. That piece of that last bullet point perhaps is a little hard to understand, but it builds on what I talked about in terms of the hip thrust. So um, I have put on this uh, as supplemental video footage, Thomas Longa sculling from the top and his boat is completely balanced. If you know anything about Thomas Longa, he was a big guy, he's about 220, 6'2", built like a football player, really strong, had a big massive upper body. The trick, I think, and I use the word trick, the trick to his balance was the fact that he used the mass of his um, upper body, translated to the oarlocks, in essence, building on what Fairbairn used to say about holding the oarlocks down, created a balanced effect. It also helped the boat run underneath the seat when the blades were out of the water. Um, it's a trick, it works, it requires relaxation, it requires a sense of constant pressure, which I didn't really get into all that much in this talk, but it's really something that makes a lot of sense and I would encourage you to do it. However, if you're trying to get your hands out of bow and straighten your arms out and come up to the catch, that's what gets you in trouble because then it's very hard to stay relaxed and to use the mass of your body to um, weight the oarlocks. And so if you dig into this, there's gonna be some relatively um, provocative in, uh, realizations that you're gonna to have to embrace if you wanna move forward with this particular slide. Okay, let's see, next concept, please. All right. Uh, this one is building on the thing. The skulls and the foot stretcher are points of reference where weight that is resting on the sit bones is evenly transferred using the muscle contraction of the core continuously. So um, that has to do with the sit bones. And the sit bones, as I've said to many people, the sit bone, bones are to sculling what the balls of your feet are to playing tennis. You got to keep your weight on your sit bones. Um, there are some rigging implications of that, which we could get into if questions go in that direction. But um, the contraction of your core as you get to full flexion and the blades go into water, 
I would suggest thinking about tightening your stomach and your buttocks, keeping your legs flexed for a moment. Your leg drive will occur naturally. Um, when the blades are out of the water, contracting your abdominals, contracting your hip flexors, keeping that upper body weight um, directed sideways, lifting the elbows up, which is very, very important, um, would be very helpful. One thing that I do with my sculling, which seems sort of silly, is when I'm on the recovery phase of the stroke, I try to lift my elbows up and I lift up my knees and my elbows in a coordinated, unified fashion. So you may want to think about that. I didn't put it into this bullet point. The idea of, of lifting your elbows and lifting your knees up at the same time really has a positive effect on the run of the boat. Okay, next one, please. All right, if you want to go faster, move more weight more quickly to the ends of the skulls soon after the skulls leave the water. So this is a good one for people that like to race or just if you want to go faster, how do you go faster? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb about this a little bit. I may get some pushback from coaches, but I would suggest that the time in the water, when you're in the water phase of the stroke, as you go faster, the time in the water approaches a constant. The only way that you can go faster is if you bring the boat underneath you quicker. And so if you look at stroke rate as a function of time, um, as the boat goes faster, the stroke rate will go up. And that stroke rate is a function of the time in the water, the time of the catch and the release, and also the time on the, what's known as the recovery. When you bring the boat up underneath you faster, you will go faster without necessarily doing more in the water. And so be careful about that. And I brought this concept into the talk because I think a lot of people, when they try to go faster, they try to do too much in the water and all they do is get really tired and go slower. So I would encourage you to think about this one. There's a lot that you could un, un, unpack on this particular slide. Okay, what's the next one? I'm trying to keep an eye on the clock here, go ahead. Um, yeah, and this gets into that, just what I just said, discard the idea of sculling harder and substitute with the concept of quicker core contraction. So um, quick and light would be one way to think of it. Not hard, quick and light. And so I really um, bristle when coaches say to their athletes, row harder or skull harder. I really don't think that's a, pr a particularly helpful term. Um, I think that makes people slow. It makes them think about force. I think that in reality, as your stroke, as your, as your cadence goes up, uh, the biomechanical aspects of that, at least in my opinion, you're actually your force production goes down. And there's a principle in biomechanics, there's an inverse relationship between speed of contraction and force application potential. So I would suggest if you wanna go faster, don't think harder, think quicker, lighter. And that requires more, um, more core contraction, but it done at a quicker uh, pace, so to speak but you have to stay relaxed to do it. And then I say a higher cadence will result as well as a higher average velocity. And that's a little bit more of the physics of sculling, but I threw that in there just to uh, uh, tease you along in that regard. Okay, what do we got next, Troy? Um, this one is really important. And I asked uh, Erica to uh, put the concept to animation <clears throat> of the blade movement in the water on as a supplement to this. So you can check it out if you'd like. But the rhythm, and coaches use the word rhythm a lot, and scholars talk about rhythm and that sort of thing. I think the concept of rhythm and sculling would be a very in-depth and multifaceted, nuanced conversation. But to keep it relatively simple, um, the rhythm of the stroke um, has a lot to do with the animation of the blade that Concept2 so um, expertly demonstrated on their website. And um, without getting too far into that, I would just suggest that the rhythm is more than two to one, one on the drive and two on the recovery. It's way more than that. And I would also suggest that the expense of putting the ergometer in a little bit of a negative light, the ergometer rhythm and the rhythm on the water in a single or a sweet boat for that matter is very different having to do with the concept two animation, in my opinion. Um, one aspect of this, which we could get into more if you want to talk about that animation um, is the idea of the blade stalling. And I think that that in combination with the slowing of the, of the motion of the blade relative to the boat has incredible implications for the sport. Um, one little insight that you might gain on this is if you listen, if you're sculling really well and things are really clicking, listen to the sound that the seat wheels make and you'll notice that the sound drops in pitch somewhere near the point where the blades come right at right angles to the, to the keel. So note that, and I would, su would suggest 
that what you're experiencing is you're experiencing something um, similar to the animation that Concept 2 talks about in terms of the blade movement and the stalling aspect of the blade. So I'll throw that one out there. That's, a, that's probably a whole other webinar in and of itself. Okay, next one, please, Troy. All right. Um, and this one is probably, Erica thought this was going to cause a lot of uh, consternation. Um, and at Craftsbury, we talk about one blade and one or handle in front of the other. Um, but I would suggest that the idea of left over right is really, really detrimental because what it does is it puts too much weight. It tips you to your right. And so it always has too much weight on your port sit bone. And I think that if you're doing that, your ability to be athletic and to be rhythmic is really um, impeded. So what do I want to do with this one? Well, um, I write, instead the skull, let's see, successful use of the core cannot occur if one handle is above the other because the shell will tip and the weight on the sit bones will be uneven. Instead, the skulls will automatically become juxtaposed one to the other as a result and effect of core activated weight shift between the orlocks if sufficient differential height between the orlocks has been established. So that's maybe a little hard to understand, but I would suggest that you want to have your left hand and your right hand one to the other so that your handles um, do not ever go above your hands. You don't cut up your knuckles, et cetera. But this has some implications which may uh, cause people consternation if you insist that the, or be symmetric, the uh, sculling be symmetrical. So in the next bullet point, I say sculling is not a perfectly symmetrical activity. The challenges of sculling are very similar to the technical rhythmic challenges faced by two rowers in a pair. And if anybody on this um, webinar this afternoon has been to Craftsbury, you probably heard me say that a single is a pair that's been squashed together. So I would suggest um, that you take a look at this. And part of the um, downloaded video, there's a, there's a loop that I made of Thomas Langa, and there's some exquisite footage of him on the top, sculling from the top. If you look at that very carefully, and it's in slow motion as well as regular speed, you will notice that the oar handle, his his skulls are at different angles relative to the keel. I have another great picture of this, of Larry Kokaski, the great lightweight from the New York AC. So again, this is probably another webinar talk, but I would just want to throw this out to you because in, the reason I put it in is because when you're tipping to one side all the time, your core is really impeded in my opinion. And I think that getting your core activated means that you have to be evenly weighted on your sit bones. You can't do that if your left hand's over your right hand. Um, Last one, and this is where Erica laughed at me and said, you're going to get pushback on this. Leg, hand leg dominance is to be taken into consideration. The higher orlock should be the orlock that corresponds to the sculler's dominant side. And um, I don't know everyone on this call, certainly, but if you're right-handed and you're right foot dominant, what does that mean? It means that you should be sculled right over left, so to speak, than left over right. I know that's really going to cause people to grit their teeth and hate me but I just have to say it because I believe it. And I, I started out sculling with my left over my right. Um, I won't go through that process and how painful it was, but eventually when I watched Thomas Longa, I was so enraptured by his sculling that I said, the first thing I need to do is to be like him is to um, get my right oar lock higher and my left oar lock lower. So um, I, at the expense of smashing my thumbs together one summer in 1996, I uh, made the change and I noticed my sculling got better. Um, I think hand dominance and orlock height, um, again, is probably the, the meat of another webinar. But I just wanted to throw that out to you. I realize that in a lot of times your boats are not rigged accordingly and there are some issues that with that if you're in a club, et cetera. So I get all that and I respect it. But at least if you can keep your left hand and your right hand one to the other, check out the supplemental video footage of Thomas Langa. Just make a switch in your mind. So this means that to catch your left oar handle, which is your starboard side, would be more acutely angled to the boat at the catch. The port would be less. And then at the release, your port handle would be closer. Your left hand would be farther away. So both sides are going through the same number of degrees uh, at the oar lock, if you want to think of it that way. But the angles are a or the oar handles are juxtaposed one to the other. So I threw that one in there. Maybe this is a little too technical, but I would encourage people to at least give this some consideration. What's the next one? Oh, acknowledgements. Um, okay, uh, I can acknowledge the acknowledgements. I'm not going to go through. They're listed on the supplemental. Um, and I just listed some people that have been very inspirational for me um, in my coaching. And um, I continue to um, think of them. Some, unfortunately, are deceased, but I really uh, find inspiration from 
their uh, wisdom. So anyway, we're about 15 minutes to go in this hour long talk. And I think there's probably some questions or maybe not, but I'm gonna turn this over to Erica. Thank you. Okay, just a moment. Okay, so the first question came from Ellen. Um, who also coaches here at Craftsbury, so Rick knows her well, and she asked, does the rotation of the pelvis at the release send the hips to the bow? It sends, yes, it sends the hips in the bowward direction. It doesn't send them to the bow. So the bow of the boat and the hips are one at one point, they're unified at that point. And so the boat and the hips move as a unit forward toward the finish line relative to your shoulders, which are also moving toward the finish line. So in essence, what happens in my view is that the, your tailbone, your hips, actually at the key point of the release, actually swing underneath your shoulders and move toward the finish line faster than your shoulders are moving toward the finish line just before the release, if that makes any sense. Does that answer your question, Ellen? I hope, maybe. <laughs> Hi, Ellen. Okay. Uh, the next question is also from a Craftsbury coach, and then I think we'll go to names that are not familiar to me. So this one is from Mike Wagner, and he's asking, do you recommend or encourage, encourage a sculler to be mindful of striving to keep the shell running level versus seeing the stern dip as the blades meet the water on each stroke? Um, okay, Mike, well, the question on, on that, that question is a good one. It would depend a little bit on the um, position of your foot stretcher. Um, if you're bringing the boat underneath you, the boat may still dip depending on how your boat is trimmed. But uh, I would suggest that if the boat is severely dipping at the catch, and the boat is not running out, then that's going to be what commonly is called check, or at least one aspect of check, which I would consider to be, and I think you would as well, um, appreciate that as being relatively um, non-desirable. Okay. Okay. So next question is from Laura McNally, who asked, can you please talk a little bit more about not doing the segmented legs, body, arms, arms, body, legs, and asked, what do you prefer instead? Um, Okay, so what I would prefer is um, if you're talking about the drive phase of the stroke when the blades are in the water, that have all your, body all your body parts finish at the same time, which is not new. There's coaches who talk about this. But so your leg extension, your leg drive, so to speak, your knee, your legs expending at the knee, your arms bending at the elbow, your torso swinging toward the bow, that all those movements uh, would all stop moving as your blades release. So there wouldn't be a segmentation, like your legs are straight or flat, then your body moves, then your arms bend. Everything is moving together. Everything stops moving as you release. And then conversely, uh, on the recovery, everything would unfold together. The big problem coaches have with that is that frequently people are afraid that the sculler is gonna hit their knees with their oar handles or hit the oar handles with their knees. So they'll frequently say, keep your legs straight until you get your body over get your arms out, get your body uh, over, et cetera, and then bend, bend your legs, so to speak. I understand that, but um, I think if you keep your legs extended and keep your quad muscles tight, you will be able to get that body pivot that Ellen was just asking about, and your knees and your handles will not meet each other. Uh, so anyway, that would be the reverse, so to speak, of the drive. So legs, torso, shoulders, and arms together, um, tors legs, torso, shoulders, and arms, uh, when the blades are out of the water, going into the water as everything stops moving and you catch the water again. If that helps, I'm not sure. Watch, watch, um, watch um, uh, the, the tape of Napkova in the 2004 Olympics and how much she bends her arms right at the catch. And uh, she does a great job. She wins the Olympics in 2012. So Napkova is a really, really nice example of everything finishing together. That makes any sense. That's a visual for you if that verbal description doesn't really help. Okay, so next question, um, your favorite topic. Uh, Gail Brownell asked if the rowing machine, if using a rowing machine is unavoidable, do you have any comments for scholars on how to make rowing machines useful? Um, yeah, I think you can use, I think this rowing machine has some overlap. I would suggest, first of all, um, if you don't get too caught up in the score. So one of the things we do with the athletes on my team, we use dynamic ergs, by the way, instead of the normal traditional erg. But if you don't have access to a dynamic erg, one of the things I would do is I would take a piece of paper and cover over the monitor so all you can see is the stroke rate and the time. So I would, at least for some of your workouts, I would monitor heart rate. I would not monitor output. So if your heart rate is a certain level, I would think that that would be 
adequate. I would not look at the, um, the, the, the meters per, you know, the number of meters time per 500 and all that sort of stuff. I would keep that off the table. I would also say rowing with the ergometer with your feet loose would be very helpful. That's another good one. Using a mirror would be very helpful if you can access a mirror. Um, and then as far as your ergometer goes, one thing I like to tell people is when you're rowing an ergometer, put your thumbs on top of the handle, not underneath. When you put your thumbs on top, you won't squeeze the handle. Squeezing the handle gets you in the habit of doing that when you're on the water. That would be another one. Um, perhaps you've heard this one, that the oar handle should be moving parallel to the water. And the amount of up motion when you're on the drive phase, as opposed to the downward motion of the oar handle, um, should be very, very slight with a nice little rounded movement at the catch and a little rounded movement at the release to try to make your oar handle movement as parallel to the floor as possible and as subtle as you possibly can. Um, and then um, be conscious of the feet and flexing your ankles and the idea, you can do this on a, on a dynamic better, but you certainly keep your ankles flexed as you move on the recovery. Think about um, slide control, making sure that your seat slows down as you approach the point of the, uh, the catch, so to speak, if that helps. Um, and there have been a couple questions about your thoughts on non-C2 ergometers. I don't know if you want to get into that. Um, I don't, I really can't say, I don't really know that much about it, to be honest with you. I, we have concept twos. I, I've seen row perfects. Um, uh, I know, oh, well, that's not totally true. I do think that the um, ergometer that Calvin Coffee makes, which is a true sculling ergometer, so to speak, is probably um, in some ways ideal. It's, it's big and it takes up a lot of room, but I do think that that sculling ergometer does facilitate a closer um, simulation of sculling. I don't think it's sculling, but it's probably closer. And I would encourage people to try that if uh, you're interested in ergometers and if your budget um, allows. Okay, so also kind of an equipment related question from Rachel Kent. She asked, up to now, I've been using a seat pad to gain more torso height, but I fear that it impedes my ability to feel my sit bones in the boat. Does this fit with your experience? Absolutely. Yes, I absolutely would say, suggest that that's what you're doing um, with the sit. The seat pad is not the way to do it. If you need, if you have a sh relatively short torso, then what you need to do is you need to build up the seat. Um, you need to build the seat up. And so you have your, your buttocks are in close connection to the seat as opposed to a squishy sort of seat pad, which is very, very hard to uh, feel. So what you're feeling is correct. And I would encourage you if you have to, someone who's good with woodworking or knows how to work with fiberglass is to build your seat up. Also seat pads, by the way, do not really build your weight up that much. You'd have to probably build up the seat depending on your torso length, et cetera, by using a block of wood or plastic or something like that. So I think you're on the right track. I would encourage you to, um, to uh, use the, uh, build a seat up with something substantial so that your buttocks are firmly connected to the, seat, the sit bone holes and um, that you're feeling really comfortable and you're feeling really grounded is very, very important. Okay. Um, so John Ippolito asked, does rowing from your core imply a change in the amount of layback or the shape of the spine? Um, that's a good question. And I would suggest the shape of the spine um, at the release. Let's talk about that. I would say at the release, the shape of your spine is you're going to be doing what I would call a pelvic tilt. So there would be, a, you're drawing really tight in with your lower abdominals, your lower back will be rounded a little bit, your toes are pointing, you're sitting up tall, your elbows are out, your weight is being applied to the sides of the, um, to the or, the or locks through your thumbs, and you'll have a little bit of a rounded back as if you were doing um, a pelvic tilt. And so that um, perspective at the catch, I'm sorry, at the release, and then at the catch, I would say you want to do what I loosely call a reverse pelvic tilt where you're trying to arch your back a little bit. But having a back that's generally relaxed up in the shoulders, but still keeping a really firm um, core or stomach lower back area uh, would be desirable. So um, really being hunched over, particularly I think is, is impedes your breathing. And I do think it uh, takes away from your athleticism. Um, again, this presupposes uh, no structural deformities or problems or injuries and or 
proper lower back and hamstring flexibility too, which would be difficult to talk about in this, in this uh, venue. Um, sort of related, uh, I got a question from an individual who has developed an injury, a compressed nerve row at S5, and he was told that rowing wasn't the best activity. Um, he was wondering if you had any suggestions for how to protect the spine while rowing, which I know you don't want to give any medical advice. <laughs> well, I, again, without seeing, without understanding more about the injury or watching the, this person's skull, I would be hard pressed to be able to come up with anything really quick. But I would suggest that if the boat is not tipped to port um, and you're sitting on your sit bones comfortably, and your seat is not too low relative to your feet, and you don't have any other structural issues prior to sculling, that perhaps your back injury was a function of, of doing too much with your legs too soon in the stroke against a really heavy load uh, at the catch. So I would suggest that perhaps that's the source of your injury. Again, I can't be sure, I don't know, um, but lower back injuries and in sculling or rowing are not uncommon and one of the cautions that I have for people, and most everybody uses hatchet blades, you have to be really careful about the exertion and the way you exert your body um, and your lower body at the catch. This thing about using the core would tend to diminish severe leg drive at the catch in favor of more of a body swing at the catch, which I didn't really get into in this talk particularly, but that is implicit. Using your core would imply or show everything finishing together, which means your legs are not extending as quickly as they otherwise might if you were in a leg drive, legs back arms um, approach, if that helps, I'm not sure. Check that out in re relationship to your back injury. Okay, and then another question from the same person was, um, I was surprised to hear that racing relies on speeding up the hands away. I'd always heard not to rush the slide. So if you could address that. Um, well, when, well, rushing the slide implies that you're sliding to the stern. Uh, what I'm talking about is bringing the boat underneath you. So after a careful technical development and the proper orientation at a low cadence, when you finally get the idea of drawing the boat underneath you and you're patient and very powerful to the release and you get that good hip thrust, that's when you actually bring the boat underneath you. At that point, uh, and you can see this with really good scullers, that they actually have a negative ratio meaning that the boat, the recovery, so to speak, from a visual perspective is actually faster than the drive. But that doesn't mean that I'm asking you to hurry up to the catch. I'm talking about this idea, and it may seem as a theory as opposed to impractic, impractically, um, is the idea of the boat coming underneath you. And as you start to go faster, the time, as I said, reaches a constant. The only way to go faster is to take more strokes and take more strokes when the blade's in the air meaning that the boat moves underneath the seat faster. This also builds into another idea about constant velocity of the hull, which we didn't really get, I didn't have a chance to get into. So I don't know if that answers the question, but you're certainly not coming to the catch. Somebody just showed up on the machine. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Who's that? Hey, how you doing? How are not you? sure. Hey, Kevin Steele, oh, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got, right. we got back here. Good to see you. He stole the spotlight. Okay, so yeah. um, next question. Uh, Steve asked if, um, if you could talk more about stalling. Ah, the, the stalling, all the stalling is, well, if you go to the Concept2 website and you look at the animation, you'll notice that the blade, as the boat moves forward, the blade moves sideways uh, toward the finish line on an angle. And at one point it stops moving sideways it pauses and then starts moving back on an angle toward the keel of the boat. The point where it pauses is frequently referred to as a stall when the blade stalls. A little bit like flying an airplane straight up in the air. And if you fly on air, if you've flown in an airplane, I haven't flown a plane, but if you fly straight up in the air, what happens is the plane loses lift and it drops. Well, that's not what's happening here, but the idea of a stall when the blade stops moving and transitions from going out to coming in is a very provocative um, aspect of the Concept2 animation, which has some really interesting implications for the stroke, but you have to be willing to uh, feel for that and understand it and look for it. And um, pounding your legs at the catch doesn't usually give you that uh, feel. So anyway, 
that's why I, that's why I think that all the body parts together is intrinsically more in keeping with sculling. And one thing I didn't mention in my talk, which I'd like to throw out. There's a distinction between rowing and sculling. So if you're going to be sculling, don't use the word rowing, which is a pet peeve I have uh, with some of our coaches at Crashbury. They use rowing and sculling uh, synonymously, which they're not. So sculling is more the concept to animation. Rowing is rowing a rowboat or something like that. <laughs> I'm saying that to tease Erica a little bit, but anyway. Yeah, see, every time I tell him I'm going for a row, he's like, no, you're going sculling. I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm going sculling. Okay, um, next question um, from Susan Farewell. She asked, this not being a traditional rowing season, I'm just grateful to be on the water and have not had the motivation to follow a training program. Do you think it is important to always be training as opposed to just enjoy, enjoying sculling in order to constantly improve? I, I would be, um, what comes to mind, Susan, hi, Susan, but anyway, what comes to mind is a quote that I read in an English sculling book once, which I, I think I put in my supplemental notes. This sculler, the sculling coach from England wrote, hundreds and hundreds, to get better at sculling, you need hundreds and hundreds of miles of sweet sculling, sweet sculling. And I would argue that if you get the rhythm correct, and I know Troy's probably going to bristle at this one, but if you get the, the rhythm correct, you don't have to be that fit because you know the tricks. And so sculling is more about rhythm than it is about absolute effort. Yeah, you got to be fit, but knowing how to do it and being able to find a rhythm is immensely more um, productive and efficient. So to answer Susan's question, Susan, go out there and enjoy the movement, pay careful attention. That's not an excuse for being sloppy, but um, uh, embrace the, uh, the rhythm, especially this year because there aren't any races anyway. So it might be a good time to, to deconstruct your stroke and, uh, and investigate it, take some time. I think this is important. I've also, just as an aside, encouraged um, Steve Welpley, our GRP coach, to, uh, to take this opportunity with no racing coming up this year internationally or nationally, that uh, this is a chance to really make some changes in people's technique. Okay, um, so next two questions are hand related. One of them isn't really a question, it's more a comment. I think right when you were talking about left over right on that, la or right over left on that last slide. And she just said, I, I've often heard left in front of right with the right hand sort of nesting into the left hand as they cross, then hands stay at the same height and both stable. And I think that's typically how we talk about it here at Craftsbury. Yes. Yeah, I would agree. That's a pretty good start. Yes, pretty good start. Again, keeping your fingers really loose. Got to keep loose fingers. Wiggle your fingers and wiggle, wiggle your fingers and wiggle your toes. Keep wiggling. We got to keep loose. If you start squeezing, you're in bad shape. So, in my um. opinion. And then related to that, Mike Wagner asked, um, when you're watching Thomas Longa skull, what have you observed with how he holds and rotates his handles? Um, uh, I would refer, uh, Mike, what I'd like to do is have you look at the, um, the YouTube sculling of Thomas Longa, not the one that's, there's, it's, on, it's attached, and you'll see how loose his hands are. His hands are just resting on the handle, and the squaring and feathering a la Jim Joy occurs mostly with his fingers minimize the wrist action. And that has to go first and foremost with a loose uh, relationship between your, thumb, your thumbs and your hands on the handles. The problem with loose is that people have trouble keeping their fingers loose on the handles because they want to pull hard. And so part of the stuff about keeping your hands really loose is that your hands have to stay loose, but then how do you apply force to move faster and how do you apply force? And I think a lot of it comes through your toe, uh, through your, through not your toes, comes through your thumbs. So when I want to go faster, I apply more lateral force through my thumbs. And the way I do that is by sitting up quicker, sitting up taller. And that lateral force is generated as I lift my weight vertically relative to the uh, sit bones or rel relative to the seat, I guess you'd say. Okay. Um... And then the next question is another topic that you're quite fond of, which is um, she, Megan asked if you could talk about the variations of foot contact to the foot stretchers throughout the stroke. Okay, so um, just to, I refer to you to 2018 tech tips that Eric was so kind to of put up. So look at the tech tip, it's on there, but just to get into this a little bit, what I like to do is to talk about what you should look for or feel for in your feet at the extremities of the stroke. So what would be Fairbairn would talk about at the turns. So, and then everything in between, let your natural, for lack of a better term, athletic wisdom figure it out. So basically 
what I do when I'm sculling is as, as I say to myself, okay, what do I want as the blades ex release? And what do I want when the blades go in? And I look for those two extremes between dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Everything in between, I let it take care of it, take care of it itself and just aspire to those two movements. So I let my internal athletic wisdom come up with everything in the middle. So just to give you a quick synopsis, just before the blades release the water, your toes are pointing, you're on the balls of your feet, your heels are up, your toes are down, just as the blades are gonna release the water. As the blades release the water, your toes come up, your heels go down, and then you continue to flex your ankles. You flex your ankles as you continue to do that. Most people don't have incredible ankle flexion. Your heels come up, your toes are curled back toward your toe nails are toward your ankles. You're flexing your ankles, you get to the fully catch position. Just as the blades are going in the water, your toes are flexed as, care, as closely to your ankles as possible and your ankles are flexed relative to your lower leg. Do that, look for those two extremes, everything else takes care of itself. That would be my suggestion. I, I don't get into articulating every part of the stroke, I think that becomes confusing. If that helps, I don't know. Check out, check out the uh, tech tip from 2018, Crashbury's tech tip. I just shared the link in the chat. So if anyone oh, wants Thank to you. refer to it, they can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So question from Guy. Um, he asked, I think, so he's interpreted, interpreting um, when you were talking about accelerating the cadence as the water phase remains at a constant velocity, but the air phase is what, what is quicker. Would you agree with that? Is that the correct interpretation? Yes. Yes, I would say that. I would say, well, I would say that the air phase is gets faster the the water phase stays um, at the same speed or the time in the water stays at the same speed and that's where you get that's where you get the overall increase in the average velocity you're taking more strokes so it's like uh, it's like you were doing hops and instead of hopping at 10 hops a minute you're hopping at 30 hops a minute the hop part stays the same it's just that you're lifting your knees up faster and you're hopping more times per minute so if I hop 30 times a minute with the same energy that I hop 10 times a minute, I'm going to go farther. I'm going to go faster. That's the idea. Okay. Okay. Um, question from Cornell about, um, he asks if there's a feeling during the recovery similar to going backwards on a swing. Uh, on the recovery or the drive? Well, actually both. I mean, there's an idea of swing, but swing, usually feeling of swinging on a swing is usually more, um, uh, experience when the blades are in the water, that idea of leaning backwards and your leg extending and kind of pumping your legs. But the same thing can be felt when you're swinging um, out of the water. So when you swing on a swing, you lean back and pump your legs and then you're, you change direction and your chest goes toward your knees and your knees come up. It's that same sort of thing. So yes, to answer the question, swinging on a swing would actually be quite instructive. And um, I'll throw this out maybe Troy's left the meeting, which is good because he'll probably not like this. But if you could swing on a swing for 20 minutes and then get into a shell and make it feel like swinging on a swing, I think you would be um, surprised, elated, and startled as to how much swinging on a swing and sculling are the same. And I, I've been trying very hard since Norm was the director to get a swing or swings set up at the waterfront so people could swing on a swing like a child swing for adults prior to sculling because I'm very confident that swinging on a swing and the dynamic of that would be immensely helpful in learning how to scull. Um, but I've been uh, the source of um, uh, a lot of jokes about that, but I still want to throw it out just as an idea. So go on a swing, swing for a while, get in a single and scull, see what happens. Yeah, Rick, I, I just heard Norm telling me that uh, this meeting is over. <laughs> well, I have run over my time, so I'm done an hour and 10 minutes, so you can cut me off well, anything you want. Actually, if there's a, if Erica can keep fielding questions for a few more minutes. Um, we, we, we scheduled it for an hour and 15. Okay, thank you, Troy. I appreciate that. I know Norm is listening and, and saying whatever he's saying. <laughs> Okay, I do have two more questions. So okay, if anybody thanks. has anything last minute they want to get in, you should do it now. Um, but the first of those two questions um, from Jolene asking, any advice for wet, sweaty hands and ore handles in hot, humid weather? 
Oh, good one. That's a good one. Uh, okay, a couple things. First of all, wristbands. We're like in tennis. We're a wristband. That's the first thing. Secondly, secondly, make sure I do this with all the time. When I come off the water, I hose off my boat and I take some cleanser, some Clorox cleanser, and I clean my oar handles with a scrub pad and cleanser and I wash them off. That keeps the hand oil off your sculling handles. The other thing I do is I take some sandpaper, a fine sandpaper, and I sandpaper lines in my, um, in my sculling handles, like along the shaft. So up and down as if you're going back and forth along the shaft of the skulls. I sandpaper the oars so that I put fine lines in the grip, so to speak, depending on what kind of grips you have, I don't know, but whatever. And I do that and that helps for the water to actually, your fingers will stick to the handles better um, in that regard. So you might wanna try that and see if that works. I suspect that part of the, the problem is, first of all, the sweat is coming off your arms, use the wristband. Secondly, your oar handles, if they're cleaned without any uh, hand oil and with a little bit of lines in there, it's a little bit like in sailboats it's called wet sanding. When you wet sand a boat, the water sticks to the, the water sticks to the oar handle and your fingers will stick to the oar better and you'll have more control. Try that and see if that works. Okay. Um, okay. I have gotten a couple more in the last few moments. Okay. So here's one. Um, Ellen Ryan asked, my body tends to tip slightly to the port side, which results in my needing to put more pressure on port to row in a straight line. And someone else also just asked, I tend to skull to port instead of in a straight line. So any suggestions for how to correct that? Okay, um, to go back to one of those slides near the end of my presentation, I would, in most cases, if your boat is rigged properly and the skeg is in proper shape, et cetera, I, I suspect it's because your left hand is too high, your right hand is too low, and what's happening is, is your port handle or your port skull is coming out a little bit too soon relative to starboard, which is usually too deep, and that's pushing you to port. So the first thing you need to do is to get the weight even on your sit bones, put your left hand farther away from your right hand, raise your right elbow up, lower your left elbow, get your weight uh, properly set so that you're not leaning to port. But if you're if you're left over right and the boat's tipped to port and your port side comes out early, you're always going to go to port. It's very, very common. We see that all the time at Crassberry. Uh, in fact, I've teased Troy the best way to skull at Crassberry is to reverse the traffic pattern. So instead of everybody going to the center, everybody runs in the shore, but we haven't got there yet. But anyway, suffice to say, I suspect it's because of the left over right thing. Try to revisit that idea and put one hand in front of the other um, with the requisite adjustments that I've suggested in, this, in the slides. So that leads nicely into what I believe is the last question I have. Uh, if I missed anybody's, feel free to shout at me quickly in the chat. But um, this is from Judith Devins, who said, with the recommendation of having the dominant hand or lock higher, does that mean that the right hand should also be in front of the left instead of the left in front of the right? Yes, if you can rig your boat accordingly. Yes, if your coach is, um, appropriate, is, is encouraging you to do that. The other part of it, too, is if you row in a team boat, you can't do that if the other people are left. So if you want to have, quote unquote, right over left, and everybody else is left over right, and you're in a quad or a double, you're going to have a big problem. So I mention that more theoretically. I understand, practically speaking, that most boathouses um, wouldn't like that, and boats are rigged, and, and, the, and the differential is built into the rigger. So I would suggest that it would only be something that you would try if you had your own boat that was built accordingly with the differential being higher on port than starboard. Sometimes you can do it with washers. Usually it's built into the rigger. But even if you can't do that, hand dominance aside, putting the left hand stern with the right hand is really important, in my opinion, as I just described, to keep the boat off port. So anyway, okay. anyway, thank you. All right, I think that's it for questions. Awesome. Um, thank you seeing a couple of thanks from people. Um, I think, do you want to just, I guess I can share. We, we've shared the link in the chat a couple of times, but there's a compilation of supplemental materials, which includes Rick's slides, as well as some additional notes with those slides and some videos that he's referenced or just videos that he recommends and the concept two blade um, animation. So those are all shared. And then 
we're going to get this recording up on YouTube within a day or two, and we'll share the link to that on that blog post as well. So you should be able to see all of those things. Um, and I think I will pass it back to Troy now. So thank you very much, Rick. Thank you, Erica. You're really doing a great job. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Thanks both of you and thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hope you'll join us next week for our webinar. Um, what is that drill for? And um, uh, yes, uh, we need some outro music on Zoom in order to make goodbyes less awkward, but uh, we had a great turnout today as we've had for our other two. And we hope to see you guys next week. Thanks much. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, Troy. Have a good night. Nice to be with everybody. See you soon. Take care. <laughs>